and welcome. Welcome back, by the way, for the reopening of the church. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So we're so glad that we can come together and to worship the Lord together. It's good to see you. Um, we've not seen each other really together. We've looked at each other through windshields, and, uh, but grateful to God that he was providing for us and um, that we were able to do those services as we were able to do them. So grateful. Uh, the Zalazars here to worship with us again. Thank you so much. And I think as, as many would say, we are few and far between of churches that are really open. Greenfield Center opened up, and so uh, we left there just a little while ago, had a marvelous time of worship. And um, it, it's, it's time that, you know, I, I, I sent out an email uh, probably a couple of months ago now or even along the way there, and I talked about faith and foolishness. And I, and I shared my conversation I had with Dr. Falwell about that. And, uh, you know, there is a fine line between faith and foolishness. And, and as he said to me, when you cross that line from faith into foolishness, you will know that. And we did not want to do that. But at the same time, you can, you can also not cross over into faith. And so we have done what we ought to do. And I would just share this with you, is that the United States Constitution protects our freedom to worship. And I will this week call on pastors to please stop asking the government leaders as to when the churches can open. This is our freedom to worship. And we are mindful of one another. The Bible says that. Consider the welfare of others above yourselves. And we have been doing that and we will continue to do that. But at the same time, as a dear brother in Christ uh, sent to me not too long ago, that um, science is good, but scientism is a twisted form of that. And authority is good, but authoritarianism is a twisted form of that. And we, I believe, have now crossed over into authoritarianism and scientism, and we have twisted those good things. And so the good people, and we are only good because Christ is good, and he is in us, we are gathering together to worship. And I believe that God will honor our faith and we're going to continue to pray. Um, well, I'll get to this in prayer. But in the meantime, so glad. Just a couple of things that we are going to do a little differently. So for the offering today, um, the offering is going to be in the back on the way out. If God so leads you, that's fine. Give with a cheerful heart. Uh, we had last week, the, the offering was out on the, on the podium out there. And uh, it blew across the street. I'll tell you what. I'd never seen two old guys run for money as quick as they did last week. <laughs> But boy, you guys took us. I don't hear it anymore. You guys can't move quick. Wow. When the money goes, woo, they were after it. And they got it all. They got it all. So, so good for you. But we're glad to see you in the house of the Lord today. Let's stand. What a beautiful song. I see a victory. And this is true. There's victory.
tape with the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord You take what the enemy meant for evil Take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Be seated And by the way, um, in case you haven't met Andy You probably saw him in the baptistry um, But I'll tell you what, he's not all wet when he plays the guitar So we're, uh, <laughs> we're glad that you're here today And uh, we're just going to have a time of, of, time of prayer our, our arrangements get messed up a little bit, but we're going to have a little time of prayer and come back to worship. So a couple things I want to share with you as we go to the Lord in prayer today is um, Paul Bubar. Man, many of you know Paul. And um, so I got a message from his daughter the night before last that Paul is days away home from glory. I don't know if he's passed or not. He has. Okay. So... Um, He's passed, and uh, but Paul was such a dear friend and a great mentor to me. Um, he's home in glory, and um, just rejoice for the man's, uh, just really his legacy. For those of you who don't know Paul, um, Jack Wurtson, when he was coming up here with Word of Life, Paul was preaching at 21 years old at Moody's Church in Northfield, Massachusetts. That's Paul's first pastorate. And so he was there at Moody's Church, and Dr. Wurtzen went to, to Paul and said, I, I think I want you to be our youth pastor and youth minister up at Word of Life. And Paul did not believe him. He thought Wurtzen had come there to test this young guy. And he called Jack Wurtzen out on it. Paul was sitting, because I called him out on this. And he goes, no, I really mean it. And Paul thought he was going to come to the church to preach just to pretty much say this little young nose guy here doesn't know what he's talking about and in the meantime he said so well, anyway um paul went and and if you know anything about bible studies for life for kids paul founded bible studies for life for word of life and an evangelist and just a marvelous man of god honored that he was here to to preach for my installation service here and again just a great friend and um paul went down the floor he, he suffered a stroke and um so I've been a couple of messages with Shirley and, uh, and then his daughter sent me one the other night. So Paul is, looks like he's home with the Lord. And so that's good news for Paul. That is, and uh, I know that no doubt when he got there in the glories of heaven, God said to him, well, well done, thou good and faithful sinner, eh, servant, enter thou into the joy of thy rest. And while he's at rest with Jesus. But I, I'll, I'm willing to say, even though he doesn't need to do it, he's probably organizing evangelism outreaches up there in glory for whatever reason it's just his heart and then a prayer of praise these are both prayers of praises um they're not here they were going to contemplate to be here but many of you met linda and greg fuller linda and greg fuller would worship with us um on and off and uh greg sent me a message uh, a few nights ago and his wife's mother Catherine. It's in a nursing home up in Maine and, uh, you know, the coronavirus and everything else in the nursing homes. So he said, would you please pray? And uh, he sent me a message uh, last, last night, I believe it was. And he said, thank you for the prayers. And he was calling on churches to pray. He said, not only is his mother-in-law's diagnosis negative, but every single resident in the nursing home in Maine does not have coronavirus. Every single one of the testings are negative, and there's not one evidence of the virus. And he attributes that to prayer. He attributes that to prayer. The power of prayer, when God's people get together and they cry out to him. Let's pray. 
Oh, Father, I'm reminded today, and it just stays in my heart, that in the Old Testament you said to Moses, I have seen my people, and I have heard their cry. I have seen my people's afflictions, and I have heard their cry, and I am come down. Even in the New Testament, the Father looks and he sees the people and afflictions. And he hears their cry. And though they don't know they need a Savior, God came down in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you see your people in afflictions. That you hear their cry. And you have also come down at the request of your son, and have given your church the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you are with us and in us. And I thank you that even when it's too difficult to pray, you take our groanings and you make them understandable before the throne of grace. We thank you, Jesus, that you are our great high priest, that you are there making intercessions on our behalf. And we praise you today. Because we will see a victory. And even in all of the evil that is going on in the world today, you take that and you turn it for good. And we bless you today, Father. We honor you and we glorify your name and we sing praises to you today. We thank you for bringing this body of Christ together again, Lord. I'm so grateful that we don't have the power to shut down what only you can shut down. You said you would... Withdraw your lampstand from the church that will not listen to what the Spirit has to say. But buildings may close, but no man has the authority to start up a church or to shut a church down. It is your church. And we come here today, your church, bringing you praise. And ask today, Lord, that you would fall afresh on us. And you would be in the midst of who we are today. Bless your name, Lord. We thank you for your mercy upon our brother Paul, that you've taken him home to glory. We thank you that grace has been fulfilled in his life. He now knows perfect love, for he has come face to face with his Savior. He now sees you, who you are, in fullness. And he now knows who he is completely. Father, we thank you for answering prayer for Linda Fuller's mom and the nursing home and for all of the residents there that they have not been stricken with this coronavirus. And Lord, we lift up to you today, even here, the Pines Nursing Home and Fort Hudson and the center and all of the different nursing homes in this area and around the area, Lord and across our state, and across our country. And we, Father, we, we present to you all of those dear souls that cannot help themselves, but, Lord, we have been entrusted into cares of others. And we pray for the caregivers, Lord, that you would give them truly caring hearts and hands to help these dear people in their years of, of maturity. We pray. Father, healing to come, healing to come, that we'd have more testimonies of nursing homes where the virus has been stricken and wiped out. Pray your watch care, Lord, over them and all the, the health care givers. We pray for the elderly in our church here, Lord, and those who have compromised conditions. But I pray, Father, that this virus will not touch them. I pray, Father, you will pass over them, Lord. That there would be testimonies breaking out. And as one man asked earlier this morning at Greenfield. He says my prayer is that the churches will be filled to capacity once again. How we pray that Lord. How we pray that every pew would be filled with people who are running to the cross. Repenting of sin. Confessing of their sin. And redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that praises would break out and they can say, I saw victory. 
Jesus showed me a victory. And even though there was some evil in my life, you have turned it out for good. Blessing and honor and praise to you, our Heavenly Father. Thank you for this time of worship, Lord. As we continue to worship you in song and in word and in fellowship, honor, honor our hearts today of faith, Lord. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen, amen. This old hymn, if you'd rather use a, a hymnal instead of the lyrics, is number 404 in your hymnal.
these choruses before, but I added some stuff. Why do I act rebelliously when love from you is all I see? Why do I turn my back on you when all I have I have? from you oh break me now overflow holy spirit you know just how much that i need to be broken break me now lead me out to the place that you have chosen break me now holy spirit break me now why do i do the things i do the things i know will displease you why don't i do what i should do the things i know that will please you oh change me now overflow holy spirit you know just how much that I need to be changed. Break me down or build me up. Oh, Father, do whatever you must to change me now. Holy Spirit, change me now. I am broken. I am bound. I am sick and overwhelmed with diseases of my own making. I open doors to every sin 
and iniquity walks in father please forgive my sin and heal me heal me now overflow holy spirit you know just how deeply my heart has been broken touch my sorrow and pain through the power of jesus name heal me now holy spirit heal me now change me now holy spirit change me now break me now holy spirit break me now Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, would you turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I've preached these verses before, but I've never preached these verses before. <laughs> it's amazing how God just overflows you and, uh, with wisdom and with understanding and with His speaking through the Holy Spirit, and uh, when I saw that Jim was going to be singing that song, I remember that song uh, that he gave to me years ago on a CD. He wrote that song, and um, some of the verses have changed, but um, I was just thrilled when I heard that song, when I, we heard a mighty fortress, a little different, but it's speaking of the Spirit of the living God, and that's my, my message today, is about living in the presence and the power of the Spirit of the living God. But I'm going to say a phrase here that you might want to plug your ears on. Might, might, might want to plug your ears on this one. It's called being baptized in the Holy Spirit. A church baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now we've been taught a lot about baptism in the Holy Spirit. But I would ask you to search the scriptures on baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because the truth is, without the Holy Spirit, I can't preach. Without the Holy Spirit, I can read the words on that book, but I can't understand them. Without the Holy Spirit, I'm not sealed unto the day of redemption. But without the Holy Spirit, I have no power whatsoever. And the Bible commands us, it doesn't ask us, but it commands the church that every day there should be a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. At salvation, he baptizes us into the body of Christ and he has sealed us in the body of Christ. Nobody can take your salvation from you. It's not possible. If you've been saved by the grace of God, salvation is yours. The forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ Jesus says, nobody can take you from my hand. And the Spirit of God seals us. Our salvation is sealed in the Holy Spirit. But what about our Christian walk? What about our evangelism? What about our discipleship? What about our music? What about our prayer? What about, what about... Why do we just gladly take what the Spirit of God does at salvation and then put him away somewhere? When Jesus says, I've given him to you as a gift. He will be your guidance to all truth. He will be your comforter and your counselor. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment he has come, Jesus has gone up, and the Spirit of God has come down. And he dwells, not only within every believer, but upon every believer. And he fills every believer. But not unless we ask Jesus for him. John said, I baptize you with water. But one is coming who is mightier than I, who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And with fire. 
You see, the Holy Spirit puts us in the body of Christ. But Jesus says, I will go to the Father and I will ask the Father. <laughs> when you pray, have you ever asked Jesus for the Holy Spirit? Would you ask the Father to send me the Holy Spirit? Because I've been doing Christian work and there's nothing going on. Why? Why aren't people getting saved? Why are not the baptistry waters troubled? Why is there no discipleship? What is happening to the church? What is happening to supposed born-again Christians all over this great nation of ours? Why are not people more like the people in the Word of God? Why, why, why? Could it be that the church has abandoned its most precious gift, the Holy Spirit? Jesus said about him, Jesus, he said, you've left your first love to the church at Ephesus. Could you imagine if your first love says, I have a gift for you, but you said, no, thank you. Or we only want part of that. Let me give to you a little bit of history here, and then we're going to read the scripture. Finney. Many of you have heard of Finney, right? The great revival took place out in Oneida County, Monroe County, just west here, not very far from, from here. City's now living in the pit of hell. But when Finney came through, wow, churches were born through the grace of Jesus Christ. This is what Finney wrote. How God gave him the mighty infillings of the Holy Spirit. He says, quote, The Holy Spirit that went through me as it seemed body and soul, I immediately found myself endued with such power from on high that a few words dropped here and there to individuals were the means of their immediate conversion. My words seemed to fasten like barbed arrows in the souls of men. They cut like a sword. They broke the heart like a hammer. Multitudes can attest to this. And there were multitudes who came to Christ at Finney's preaching. He goes on. Sometimes I would find myself in a great measure empty of this power. I would go and visit and find that I made no saving impression. I would exhort and pray with the same results. I would they set apart a day for private fasting and prayer. After humbling myself and crying out for help, the power would return upon me with all its freshness. This has been the experience of my life. Those are the words of Finney. Was Finney a heretic? Absolutely not. Was Finney a man of God? Yes, he was. Did God do great things through Finney? Yes, he did. But maybe some of you are sitting here today and you don't know Finney. But I'm positive that you all know D.L. Moody. Moody wrote these words, quote, I think it is clearly taught in Scripture that every believer has the Holy Ghost dwelling in him. He may be quenching the Spirit of God, and he may not glorify God as he should, but if he is a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost dwells in him. Though Christian men and women have the Holy Ghost dwelling in them, yet he is not dwelling with them within them in power. In other words, God has a great many sons and daughters without power. The Holy Spirit in us is one thing, and the Holy Spirit on us is another. Moody goes on to write, we all need it, the filling of the Holy Spirit, together, and let us not rest day or night until we possess it. If that is the utmost thought of our hearts, God will give it to us. If we just hunger and thirst for it and say, God helping me, I will not rest until endued with power from on high. The disciples of Jesus were all filled with the Spirit. And the word was published. And when the Spirit of God comes down upon the church and we are anointed, the word will be published in the streets, in the lanes, in the alleys. 
There will not be a dark cellar, nor a dark attic, nor a home where the gospel will not be carried by some loving heart. If the Spirit comes upon God's people in demonstration and in power. Close quote D.L. Moody. Was Moody a heretic? No. Was Moody a man of God? Yes. Finney and Moody were saying the same things. I might be saved and I have the spirit of God dwelling within me. But my ministry is producing no fruit. Read the writings of Moody. Read the writings of R.A. Torrey. Read Finney and you will see men fully walking in the spirit of of the living God. If you have your copy of God's word with you, would you stand with me to honor God at the reading of his word? Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled, that is he, the Holy Spirit, filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues or divided tongues, like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews Devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad or the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confounded. They were confused. Why? Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers, visitors of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and, Arab and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. God, speak to us today on how much we need the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, to your glory, amen. You may be seated. In all of history, all of history, there was no greater event other than the cross and the resurrection of Christ himself, than the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It was when God sent his spirit. It was the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. It was when the corporate filling of the Holy Spirit of the body of believers with the promised presence of Christ. He came to all of the believers. John 14, 16 through 18, we read, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The Old Testament, God came down. I prayed that. God saw the afflictions of his people and he heard their cries and he came down. Jesus came down. Out of heaven. And he went up. Now he's coming down again. But in between his. Ascension and second coming. God came down again. God came down. In the Holy Spirit. 
to every believer. 500 people stood on a mountainside when Jesus was getting ready to ascend back up to the Father. 500 people. It wasn't just the 11. It wasn't just 100. It was 500 people that were there. They heard him speaking and preaching about the kingdom of God. 500 people saw him go up into heaven and a cloud receive him. He's gone. 380 went back to doing what they were doing. And 120 obeyed Christ. But look what he did with 120 people. Look what he did with 120 people. Faithful people. Faithful people. He came to every believer in that upper room. He rested upon every believer in that, in that room. Because it just wasn't up to the leaders to go preach Christ. He was showing in that upper room that every man, woman, and child who has been saved by the grace of God and has been endued with power from on high not only should, but could, and no problem at all, preach Christ and him crucified to a world without Christ. Power was resting upon them. And this was the glorious presence and power of God coming out at Jesus went into heaven and he said to the Father, send the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit came to these men and women to proclaim salvation to the world. But we look at Pentecost, and if we're not careful, we will look at it only in its New Testament package. We will not see, if we only unwrap a little bit of this, we will not see Pentecost in the Old Testament. So we have to go back before we can go too much further forward. But I want to share with you something today, and this is the first point. We're going to be here for a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks. In this message. I want you to see this point. And if you have a pen. You can write these down. This demonstrates. That there is a record. To repeat. A record. To repeat. The day of Pentecost. Was celebrated. In the Old Testament. 50 days after. The Passover. 50 days after, after the Passover. It was also known as the day of first fruits or the feast of weeks. Let's go back to the record. Numbers 28, 26. On the day of first fruits, when you present to the Lord an offering of new grain during the festival of weeks, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. May I share this with you for just a moment? Whatever day you choose, I don't care what day it is, there are seven days in the week. Even God rested and did no work. The seventh day, he rested. Why don't you take rest? Why do you work every single day of the week? The world is always working. The world is always busy. If God could rest, why don't you rest? Have sacred time with God. An assembly with him. And rest. Don't worry about the yard work. Don't worry about the dishes. Don't worry about, don't worry about, don't worry. They will be there tomorrow. If you don't go home to glory or Christ doesn't come for you, don't worry. They'll be there tomorrow. There'll be more work for you tomorrow. But rest. God says rest. We need rest. Exodus 34, 22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruit. Of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Pentecost was a day of celebration. Right, Paul? Yeah, it was. Because they were, the Jews were all coming together. Now picture Pentecost. We have traveled through the Old Testament. And now the Jews are still coming together. They've never stopped. And now 50 days, they are there to celebrate. 
the Feast of First Fruits. They are there to celebrate the harvest of the fields. The harvest season was opening. Great celebration, first fruits. And it was always around the first day of June. But they were not only coming together, the, the Jews, to celebrate how God was so good to them and giving them a wonderful harvest of first fruits that they could give back to the Lord. They were also celebrating the Exodus. Oh, this was the day that they had this record worth repeating that God came down and he delivered us through Moses out of bondage. And we left Egypt. Oh, they were, had a record to repeat and they were repeating it on Pentecost. They said, God, thank you. They were, they were praising God. They just didn't get together and sit around and listen to this guy speak and that guy speak and hear a song. They came with praise in their hearts and praise from their lips. They were thanking God for all that he provided for them. They remembered the record of God and they were praising him for that. They remembered their deliverance from Egypt out of bondage. Deuteronomy 16, 12, they took the scripture with them that said, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and follow carefully these decrees. They were thanking God for the day he delivered them. They were thanking God for that day at Mount Sinai when Moses was there and God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And on that day, by the way, when they received the law of God, the nation of Israel for the first time was constituted as the nation. It was their constitution. God's given us the constitution, the word of God. They were constituted. They showed how God wanted them to live. He gave them principles. And he gave them laws. And yes, he gave them rules to govern their lives and their entire nation. God has given this great nation of the United States laws. And he has given us rules. And he has given us principles on how this nation has to be governed. And we have slapped him in the face. And we wonder why. We wonder why. We wonder why. But the Jews calculated that there was 50 days from the time of the giving of the law to Moses after the exodus. And they called it Pentecost. What's your point, preacher? Did you ever realize this? That all three events that I just mentioned from the Old Testament were fully satisfied in the coming of the Holy Spirit. They were all fully satisfied, fulfilled, if you will, in the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so this is how we know this. When Pentecost was fully come, the Bible says, first fruits were born. First fruits that we call the church. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a blessing? That's the grace and love of God. God says, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And guess what? There's going to be a harvest of souls. Now, every one of those 120 people sitting in an upper room, they believed in Jesus. They would not be there if they did not believe in Jesus. I'm going to share with you that point in just a moment. But they all believed in Jesus. Listen, every single one of them were saved. Every single one of them in that upper room was secured until the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit had sealed them. But Jesus said to them, tarry in Jerusalem and don't do anything. You wait until the promise is fulfilled because without the Holy Spirit, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Jesus said of himself in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. If anyone abide in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And Jesus is saying to these believers, you go to Jerusalem and you wait for the promise because apart from the Holy Spirit, you can do nothing. I'm going to heaven. 
I'm going to sit down at the right hand of my Father, where I will be your intercessor and your great high priest. I will advocate for you on behalf, but I'm sending to you the Holy Spirit of God. You can't do anything without him. Don't try it. So these people went there. When they were filled, guess what happens? 120 people, but thousands of people come to Christ. Thousands come to Christ. But the Holy Spirit had that marvelous purpose. He's going to come and not only live in the heart of man and work in the heart of man, but he's going to be right there upon man. And he's going to deliver every believer in Christ from all that, that, that is keeping us in bondage today. He came free. He came to set men free. He came to, to give us liberty. Just as God had delivered the Jews out of slavery, the Holy Spirit's coming to deliver men out of slavery. You say, well, wait a minute. Jesus died for my sins. Yes, but you cannot receive Christ apart from the Holy Spirit. He is the one who regenerates a heart. Somebody asked one time, what comes first, salvation or repentance? That's like the chicken and the egg. But let me share this with you. You cannot repent of your sins and you cannot be saved of your sins without the Spirit of God doing his work in your heart so you can come to Jesus Christ. He's doing his work. That's the Holy Spirit. And you come to the only one who died for your sins. The Bible says that you cannot even call Jesus Lord except for the Holy Spirit. Oh, you might call him Lord. You might use that word. But, I, but what it means is that you cannot really call him who he really is. Lord, ruler of all the universe. Ruler of our souls, of authority over life and death. You cannot call him that without the Spirit of God leaving there, leading you into there. It was the birth of the church and the presence of the Holy Spirit by his very presence there with them. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And Paul said to the church at Ephesians in Ephesians 4, 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit came and he gave us a new principle from God. <laughs> you are now guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit. You are now guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he is the one who causes us to live right before God. He is the one who equips us for ministry and for service. He, the Holy Spirit, is the one. There is a record to be repeated. In congregation, for all of you who've been here for a long while, you look at me. I've seen the pictures. I've seen every pew. Right in this very building. I've seen every pew. Filled with people who love Christ. I've seen every pew. Next to young couples. Caleb's there. And there's another child there. And there's children all over. I've seen the pictures. This church has a record. God will repeat it. It's a record worth repeating. It is to go back and say, look what you did. Look what you accomplished, Father. Through the power of your Holy Spirit. And men and women who really trusted you and believed in you. And were strengthening one another. Who were rooted and built up in him. And strengthened in the faith as they were taught. You look at me. You have a record. We have a record to repeat. But it will not be repeated without the Holy Spirit. It will not happen. We'll have wooden benches with scattered people abroad. But when the Holy Spirit, if we ask God. When the Holy Spirit comes. He will change this place. Oh, he will change it. Tremendously. How? 
How? Because not only is there a record to be repeated, but the word of God tells us that there are requirements to be imitated. You can write that down. A record to be repeated, requirements to be imitated. Requirements to be imitated. Chapter 2 and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Some of your Bibles will say they were all together in one place. Well, I can be all together at the pepper mill with other people. Right? We can be all together here in this building. I can be all together wherever I'm all together with other people. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the words mean altogether. The word altogether or in one chord means that when they were in that upper room, those 120 people, they weren't thinking about this and they weren't thinking about that. They had one purpose in mind. They all had the same mind. They all had the same heart. And they all had the same purpose. They were waiting for the promise to come. They were praying for the promise to come. All of the believers were in one place. There was obedience. All of them had the same mind, the same heart. Now they went to the city of Jerusalem. They went exactly where, in the first chapter of Acts, Jesus told to them, go. You go to Jerusalem and wait there for the promise that you have heard from me. For not many days from now you shall be baptized, right? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, you shall be my witnesses, etc., etc. So I thought about this for a moment, and I put myself as to one of those 120 people. Lord says to me, Yes, Frank. Uh, what do you, you have a question? I do, Jesus. I got a question. Hey, listen, before you, before you head back to your father, you said Jerusalem, right? I mean, I'm, I'm in the back row. You said Jerusalem, right? He said, yeah, I said Jerusalem. I got a question for you. Uh, isn't that the place where they just, like, remember they arrested you? And they beat, beat you? And they, they tied you to a pole? Stretched your skin so tight? And they flogged you? That you were near the point of death? And they, and they took you and they, they put a cross on your shoulders and then they put nails in your hands and in your feet. Isn't that the place where they killed you? Yeah, that's, that's the place, Frank. That's the place. Uh, and you want me to go there. And that's the place, Frank. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, Frank. What is it? Hey, look, uh, not for nothing, I know you got to go, but the Jerusalem place, um, remember after you rose from the dead, don't you remember that they didn't only go after you, but, but remember that we, after you rose from the dead, I mean, they were after us, Lord. Remember that you had to come get us? We, we were in houses that the windows and the dark doors were all bored up and shut. You remember that in the word of God, don't you? Remember that? Jesus appeared to them. They were in the house and all of the windows had been shut up and the doors were barred. Let me tell you something. Jesus gets in wherever he wants to get in. He said, is that the same? Place? Because, because Lord, I mean, not only did they kill you, but they, they were hunting us and they're still hunting us. Are you, it's Jerusalem, right? Yes. It's Jerusalem. I'm sure a hush fell over that room also. Can you imagine the courage it took for those men and women to go to Jerusalem and to wait there for what Jesus said they will receive? Could have been a whole lot easier to go somewhere else, right? Somewhere else. I mean, Israel, you're here. I'm so blessed today. And Julie's with that precious little girl of yours. But it wouldn't be so much easier to, to do mission and work somewhere else. I mean, where there's really, I mean, you don't, you don't really have to strive too much. Wouldn't it be easier if you always had running water and 
It wouldn't be easier if you didn't have to go into, into different towns and villages where, I mean, where there wasn't, you know, hardship and everything else. Wouldn't it be easier, Israel? But you know what? Because of their faithfulness to God and the faithful God to you and Julie, they have a record to repeat. They can talk about the record of what God has done in their lives in the mission field. Can talk about what God has done in your own life with a baby. The grace of God. Why? Because there are requirements. There are requirements to be imitated. And the first requirement for the spirit of God to come to the church is obedience. It is obedience. It is an unconditional requirement. If I, as an individual believer, if you, as individual believers, as we, as the body of Christ, if we want to receive the fullness of the Spirit of God, it is obedience to Christ. Full obedience. This is what I wrote. A disobedient Christian is outside of God's will. And the Holy Spirit does not do his work outside of his own will. The Holy Spirit is God. And a disobedient Christian outside of God's will, the Holy Spirit will not do his work because he cannot work outside of his own will. If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, I will ask the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth within you and shall be in you. Jesus answered and said, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him. And make our abode with him. The first sign of obedience for any Christian is this. Do we obey Christ, his word? Are we really obeying the word of Christ? Are we really of the same mind? Do we have the same purpose? Do we not want people to be saved? Is that not the will of the Father? His desire is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance and salvation. That's our desire, isn't it? Isn't it our desire that many would come to Christ and, that, and after they come to Christ that they would be discipled? Isn't that our desire? That's in accordance with the word of God. Go ye into all the world. Make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. Teach them discipleship to obey all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you unto the end of the age. That's obedience to God. It is following his commands. Do we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our might? Do we love our neighbor as ourselves? The Bible says, for you cannot say you love God and hate your neighbor, for the love of God is not in you, if that's your attitude. So how then in the world would the Spirit of God ever come and do his work on any one person or on any people or on any church who would gather for not the same purpose and with the same mind and be obedient to Christ? Living in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit Congregation, I believe with all my heart, and we're going to keep going here, not today. <laughs> you can just, just testing your one purpose and one heart and mind. But here it is. God has a record to repeat. I have an old record that I don't play anymore. I have an old record, but I don't play it anymore. It's not meant to be played anymore. Because I got a, I'm digital now. 
He's taken me from the old records where I was on 33 and a third or 78 RPM and he's put me digital because of Christ. You see, I have a record and I can tell people a little bit about that record. But my new record is so much better. So much better. So much better. Because it's in Christ. God wants to write afresh. Right here in this place. With everyone gathered here. He has something new for us. Something to bless us. But he cannot. And he will not. Lest we become the people that he desires us to be. And I would ask you today at our closing hymn right now. As Jim comes to close us out in his closing hymn. I pray this. That we would all seek him. That whatever way we have not been obedient to him. To come and to repent of that and to confess our sins. And even as we're going to start to gather together here on Wednesday night. Let me ask you this. How many times, how many times have we ever, ever gathered together with one purpose? To ask our Lord and Savior to go to the Father and send to First Baptist Church, South Glens Falls, the Spirit of the living God to fall on us like Finney. And like Moody, isn't it time to admit that we are powerless? But we want his power. We want him to make us into whom he wants us to be. Not for our own selves. Though that's important. So that with, as Finney said, a few words here and a few words there. Or like barbs in the souls of men. And salvation would come. And salvation would come. And then the Holy Spirit of God says, Christ is exalted. Christ is exalted. Christ is exalted. Hey, how about this? This Wednesday night, if you're able. When we come to gather. Before that time, just go to the Lord. Say, God, prepare my hearts now as we come to gather. Ask him for one thing. Ask him for one thing whenever he chooses. The disciples had to wait. But wouldn't it be marvelous to wait on the living God. For the living God to fall afresh. Upon this blessed congregation once again. And all those people. All those people who perhaps have turned away from church. That were in church. Who maybe have even read the word of God before. They will through this church. Every single person. Hear once again the wonderful works of God. Now that's an answer to prayer. Let's stand and sing. Jesus, your name is power. Jesus, your name is might. Jesus, your name will break every stronghold. Jesus, your name is life. This is number 119 in your hymnal, sorry. Jesus, your name is healing. Jesus, your name gives sight. Jesus, your name will free every captive. Jesus, your name is life. Jesus, your name is holy. Jesus, your name brings light. Jesus, your name above every other. Jesus, your name is life. Jesus, your name is power. Jesus, your name is might. Jesus, 
us your name will break every stronghold. Jesus, your name is life. We are going to meet tonight. We're going to resume our regular scheduled services. So we are going to meet tonight and resume. We will meet in here, though. Normally we meet in the back room, but we're going to meet in here. One of the things is that we, um, we have decided to reopen our services, but we're also going to be mindful um, to make sure that we keep the welfare of others as well uh, protected. So we're going to meet here tonight, and it's a marvelous place to meet. We come here to worship. We're going to come here to worship tonight, and Wednesday night we'll meet in here as well until we can start meeting in, in the back there. And, and some Sundays when it's really nice out, we've already proven we can meet outside. We can set up some, maybe we can have a bring your own chair, right? You can, you can bring a lot, no lounge chair, George, but you can bring a chair if you want, and maybe we can have a cookout afterwards and just continue to have just a great time together. So it doesn't matter where we meet, it's as long as God's people meets together to worship him. And so now unto him, if you're wondering today, if you're wondering about this virus, if you're wondering about things that are going on in your own life, if you're wondering about your children, if you're wondering about your husband, if you're wondering about your wife, if you're wondering about, if you're wondering about how, how, how can it now unto him who is able, underscore that. He is able to do above and beyond what you can ask, whatever it is, and whatever you can imagine, he is able to do and be of, above and beyond those things that you ask, and those things that you have in your mind and imagine. How does he do it? We just heard how he does it. According to the power that works within us, that's the Holy Spirit. That's how God does it, through his Holy Spirit. Do you know why he does it that way? Because the next part in Ephesians 3.20 says, so that there's glory in the church. Not only glory in the church, but in Christ Jesus through all generations. He is able. He is able. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you.